It's a great honour to uh, be a part of this uh, event, which uh, started in about 06 when it began, uh, getting formulated and, and since then moved on. The, the whole thing could not really happen without the village. That's it, well, including yourselves. Because an event like this just doesn't happen bringing a half a dozen artists together and creating it. It's, it's, it's much, much more than that. It's, it's much more engaging that brings in a community, an army of volunteers of all uh, age groups and, and engaging a lot of artists. Um, what I'd really like to say is this event is all now moved from the transitional period from being a sculpture exhibition to a Biennale. And that is a part of the educational process, pro program that we've got here to get our community, the greater community, to understand what Biennale is. And it's more than just a, a pop up uh, art exhibition and bringing sculpture from various parts of the country and placing on the portrait. It has to have more than that. It's all about dialogue, about uh, education, about passing on a, a definitive feeling that an artist is trying to portray in the And however that is done by performance, by projection, by, by phys physical structure, by object art, it's, it's all embracing. Now, I would love to introduce you to Stephen Small, who fortuitously for this event came to law serendipitously. Basically, it's fine, 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 which is the one you don't end up in a place like Lord by accident. Yeah. There has to be something, <laughs> something <laughs> beyond. <laughs> Stephen's been a wonderful uh, contributor to this event and I think for the future the questions he'll pose to me as a curator for this event and to the audience here today will be quite profound I think for everybody and Stephen I appreciate oh, your contribution. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I came to Lauren, we were, I was on the way to Chile with Rodney's partner and to the exhibition that showed Rome in Chile. We decided to stay for three days. We've been here for two years. <laughs> and I have to say, it was the most momentous time of my life because I was on that hamster, on that wheel, going round and round and round. And as an artist, you commit a year in advance for museum shows and being knowledge, which is mostly what I do. And you can't say no. And you get so tired, and then you just, you become your own. And then I came to Lorne. And I went fishing for a year at the end of the field. And Rodney is excellent at finding the best spots, but I think there was a lot of right things that the Chinese have been saying, right time, right place, right people. And this is what converged here with us. So I, um, I started to go fishing again as I did as a child, and I discovered this unique ecosystem, COVID ecosystem, that existed in the community and at the end of the pier. And at the end of the pier, you had refugees, you had biotech billionaires, you had this cross-section of people who wanted to be surprised by something. Because they, and so I began to develop the idea that the pier is really a road to nowhere. And in Chinese we call it Zen, in Chinese and Japanese Ma. It means a place of potentiality. And the pier is the road to potentiality. And in some ways, COVID is a way, a road to potentiality of what we make it. And so I met Graham, and, um, and I was thinking, oh God, local, you know, <laughs> oh, <my> God, <laughs> how bad can it be? And then they said, um, he hates to give me tickets. And so Rodney, as I brought him, let's find out who they are. And Rodney asked the person, said, well, don't bother calling Kim. Call Julian. His wife was really nice. <laughs> and so we developed this friendship. And I have to say, in my experiences, which are not vast, and being honest, 
Graham Loki is to be commended for two things, among other things. Number one, he did not make it a vanity biennale. It has a structure that is required for a biennale, which is a criteria, and we try to hold to that criteria. And I'll come back to the sense that criteria is the essence of anything you do in the context of contemporary art. Skill is essential for traditional art. Skill is the enemy of contemporary art. Because skill requires training, and that's what we call what they call art work. I gave a talk at the Venice Biennale a few years ago and said, please do not call it work. If you're a ballerina, we say to a ballerina, can you show me your work? Can I see your bloody toes? No. If you're an opera singer, you ask an opera singer to show you their work. No, you ask them to dance, you ask them to sing. And I would suggest to you, when you look at art, you see the word art. And art is essentially, as Debussy said, what is played between the notes. There is people who can play the notes on the piano, or I think, and there are people who can play between the notes. And this is a hot, this I would say is the, for me is a very defining thing. In that space, and the art doesn't know anything, it's a big space. And it's within the constricts of the space of time that we as artists try to create something that expresses ourselves between the physical constraints of the notes. Okay? And thank you, Grant. You've certainly done a wonderful job here. And for kudos to have this facility in Lauren and Spent, I, I really admire what you've done. Okay. I guess. Okay. So, what's a Vietnam? This is a good question. You have many venues for art. Museums, which we're very familiar with. Museums are very dependent on attendance. Their funding, their thing has to become relevant to the people. And some museums lose their way and they have to come back to it. But museums are there to serve the people for attendance. And to bring people in and give them the experience. And it's essential, essential aspect. A Biennale, the criteria for the Biennale is to create a temporary, a temporary space, not a, a fixed space, but where there is a sense of exploration. And I think the best Biennale, the gold standard for Biennale is, is, the, is the Venice Biennale, which was started in 1896, I believe, 1895, and the silver anniversary of the Princess Margarita of Savoy and the King of Italy. Venice decided to create the first Biennale to, to honor their 25th anniversary. It also helped that the Margarita Pizza had been named for her. So, I mean, so it's a moment. I don't know if she's more famous for the Biennale or the Margarita Pizza, I can think of. So. And the evening night, because they, they, they talk about this, and the, the Venice Biennale is the Olympic art event every two years. I'm lucky because it's all about the park. It's, it's very social. But I, I love this line. The Venice Biennale is a freewheeling festival composed of numerous elements. A smorgasbord of art that even the most vor voracious art glutton could not hope to consume. Beyond excessive. You could never in weeks in your exploration. And I think what I take, and you have Viennale in San Paolo, which is a very political one. You have one in Curitiba, which was in, which I did my first thrown in, which is a different criteria every year. Um, but a Viennale essentially has to have a strong curatorial theme. And in addition to that, my own personal view of it is, I give a talk in, in, in business schools saying, being playful is good business. And when a Biennale or anything like this has an element of play into it, of playfulness, that is the, when you reach the ultimate. And I think the person who I think is the most extraordinary artist who caught that this time was Dennis Hopper. Uh, Deborah Hopper. Yeah. In her ability to get people to dance and to get out and enjoy, this was playful. But this was high art. High art also, because she's an extraordinary artist. And it takes sometimes an extraordinary artist 
to have the confidence to do what she did. It looked so normal, bringing some old chairs out and giving a band. Believe it or not, the confidence that she has as an artist to be able to do that, express herself by rolling up a big balloon. This is, when we talk about what is high art, that to me is the top. And so, as we, as we go forward in the Biennale concept, I would suggest that we look for elements of play where we can involve the community. Second thing that happens in the Biennale, I call it the ripple effect. You drop a stone in the water and the ripples go like this. The people who worked on this throne with me, they become artists. They're not making their own art. They're, it's wonderful. I got to know so many more people. We got to learn so much. I learned so much about Australian animals. I learned about Australia, the history. And that was the that is the unintended consequences of the ripple effect of creating something like a being. And I've seen so many of you who have volunteered and you've been wonderful and you've brought the community together. That is the most valuable thing that the Biennale can give to this community. Is to be a center point every two years where people get together and communitively have playful, meaningful, serious, and not so serious experience. So, I'll talk a little bit about what is essentially a different diet in different Biennales. Biennales, in, in the Greek tradition, we say there is dialogue. This is not platonic, but we give our thoughts as gifts to each other. We don't think about, you know, a response when somebody else is talking. We think about it and we give our thoughts as a gift. There is debate where we try to win. And of course there is tragedy when we don't talk at all. That's the essence of most of my relationships. Well, that, like that. But at its best, uh, Biennale creates a forum for dialogue within the community. For people who have not met each other to meet. For people from the outside to come and experience something that you have so generously hosted and created. But this dialogue is essential. And dialogue requires trust. And that's the thing that I think the kudos and this is for a small, focused Biennale. And I would say this is a, a focused Biennale. It's never going to be a giant Biennale. But the focus and the criteria will be essential in the success of the Biennale in the future. So, art is ultimately a visual language. And people who, the contemporary art is especially challenging. But I was asked by a person to, to explain contemporary art. No, no artist will ever want to answer this question because you, just, you don't want to know. But the person was very earnest and really wanted to know. It was a young, young, young person. And I said, well, think of contemporary art as art as a Tower of Babel. There are, you walk through a contemporary art museum, there are many visual languages. You don't have to understand every one. But a Chinese poem written in Chinese, of the same poem written in, I don't understand, the same poem written in Russian, I don't understand, but the poem is written in the language I understand, I can see the beauty. So sometimes when you see art that you don't understand is challenging, Sometimes it's best to give it the benefit of the doubt that the answer was saying, I don't know, we call it To say, give it the benefit of the doubt that maybe it's a language you don't understand, and maybe you will learn, maybe you won't learn, and maybe you'll never want to learn. I was doing a performance at a museum in Rome, and I was throwing some paint at the wall. And this Argentinian artist walked beside me and said, you call that art with TV cameras around him. I said, no, I don't call it art. I'm just here for the free drinks and the food afterwards. <laughs> Please, don't blame me. You know, they call it art, that's why I'm here. I'm just here for the drink and food. Um, so, so I think that's, so we've covered basically the most important things, and that is, what is the criteria and what is the community 
embrace and how do you want to shape it as a community dialogue between yourselves and what do you want the dialogue from you for the outside to be? How, how do you want to engage with the world in dialogue? Okay. My absolute hero. I tell you, I saw so much happiness. Yeah, I agree with you there. Um, but there's been some great performances out there, and I think uh, there's time for anyone who's got a question to ask Stephen uh, about any, anything, thoughts or considerations or concerns you have about the Army now or in the future. It would be great. Oh, Brad, uh, something you mentioned to me a while back is the possibility of lawn being money becoming linked to international markets. Uh, well, I would love to see this uh, event being embraced with all the other Biennales in the world, even though, as Stephen said, a, spoken, a focused event with invite and environment. Perhaps even as little as six, eight invited internationals and eight Australians, all cross-pollinating their their responses to di different things on the foreshore. Or about if we're staying with the same blueprint that exists, that's been created for this one. Stevens has done a great fine job for the, for the pier. Uh, the future. Again, it gets back to the state of the world and where we're at and finances and all that sort of thing. That's what I'd like to see. Yeah, that may answer that. There are 200, and I believe 278 official Biennales that are registered in Venice. In addition to that, there are a number of Biennales and fruit festivals, art festivals, sculptures by the sea and everything. I think as you grow and as you refine, your criteria, and you present the, the Biennale uh, group, because we are actively creating a Biennale in Valpare, so chilling, so we're involved in this. I don't think it's necessary now, but I think it should be part of your your, your plan to yeah. merge, if you see a benefit. I see the benefit of having artists from a whole different life experience and paradigm coming here and having a, a, another a different look at the way we look at it. From their eyes they can see we could probably understand things that we can only see that are in our face. That's the problem. You've got a statement vision of uh, spirit of the place. I made connections with some, others not at all. Okay. Uh, did you as you curated that, did you look for the artist to Try to make that connection, or you just leave it to them? Uh, I, I place strong emphasis on, on, on the title of the show. Mm. Uh, again, through just giving them a little bit of grace and a bit of space to explore mm. that. Mm. Some theatre of the a little bit, and uh, it's the nature of dealing with artists. Well. Uh, I also feel on that. Biennales throughout the world in the official Biennale system are competitions. Okay. There's good parts and bad parts to that. If you have a criteria and you're competing to follow the criteria and there is a prize, people become much more interested in that criteria than if there is not a In creating the throne, I was very aware of the criteria. I was actually doing a different chronos from a ship to Venice. And then Graham looked at it and like, what does this have to do with here? And he said, can you put a kangaroo on it? <laughs> and I said, I'm doing Adam and Eve. I'm doing Adam and Eve with Bernini's columns and, and flames and jewels and, and everything. You want me to add a kangaroo to the throne? <laughs> and he said, I said, in Australia we can sell anything with a kangaroo on it. <laughs> As a joke, and I, I laughed and I went home and then I met Stuart Purvis at Australia Galleries. He's coming here tomorrow. And I talked with him about I realized that I had to learn more about the place than I did. 
and now it has a platypus, two cockatoos, two, <laughs> two a koala. I mean, it's got everything. It's got, you know, it's, and it's the, it's the you know, and it's, it's the. But the criteria of adhering to the place, if there is an incentive for people, uh, an incentive for people to follow the criteria, the more you incentivize them, the more they will follow you. You know. This year is the first time it's ever been a commission situation mm -hmm. in the history of this event, which has changed the dynamic of it. Because all of a sudden, there's no prize. The reason why I put the prizes out is because our arts funding body will not consider contributing if it's a prize show, which is sort of unfortunate in a way from their point of view. But um, then I thought, well, the only way to do this is they're all winners. Uh, that's what's happened this year, and I hope to see that again, even if it's just seeding funding for their, their next uh, vision um, future. But I don't know, does Venice actually pay? In 1966, in 1966, the students formed an uprising at the Venice Biennale saying that art in the Biennale should not be a commercial event. Most Biennales that have the Biennale system do not sell artwork. But they do sell art. Everything is for sale. The, the, the dealers are you know, they're all around. Everything's for sale. But, but I think what, what I understood about it is normally I would not, I, I'm in the Biennale context of the competition to achieve the best art possible. But we live in a different time. The pandemic has taken a tremendous toll on artists and on communities. And you, know, you look at small sculptures and you look at the things that are being sold. Well, there's more to be analyzed. To be analyzed a human aspect. And right now the art world has been suffering tremendously. And any way the be analyzed can be a part of helping artists to to recover or to gain momentum through sales, I think it's a, a very good thing. It's dicey. If you don't have a curator like Graham, if you have a curator that focuses on aesthetic art, then it will become an art fair. There has to be a certain amount of scratch your head, what is this kind of thing? But if you understand everything, that means there's one language, one visual message, and that is not necessarily the optimal suggestion. And that's why I think it's very important, whoever creates it, not focus on the aesthetic or and I tried to not try to create the same language for the person. Yeah, it's very most difficult to try and manage the whole event because it's a small sculpture thing, how that was formulated and, and, and structured, I think works, which is separate from the actual Vietnam Congress, unfortunately. So there's two things happening here. And again it's all about money funding to try and sustain this thing. That's core word for me is to try, how are we going to do this in the future? Yes, we've got a lot of money this time through the COVID handouts for the arts, which is fabulous, but way on top of there next time. So therefore we have to work this so we can still afford the organisation, afford to bring in international guests of the calibre of Stevens. Oh, you didn't bring me in. I'm uh, a refugee. Fishing <laughs> <laughs> for my supper on the shore. <laughs> 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 Um, you know, I know everybody at Foodworks. <laughs> I know everybody there. I, mean, I go, I, mean, I, I, I know everybody, all their, is that song, all of their children and all of their names, and, you know, and because there was nobody here. So we had this rare opportunity to get to meet so yeah. many people. Of the local and such. And, so that's a spirit place, too. So if, a, if you're looking for refugee artists, <laughs> Grant, will there be a, a stop for staying in the place like in previous years, or is that not good? Sorry, uh, will there be a stop for staying in the place as in previous years? Oh yes, we have. Um, well, through the generosity of Deborah, she has gifted that piece that's called mm -hmm. Face opposite the uh, that's well, in the end of Anzac Park. She's oh, giving right. that the ball, okay. and it gets back to overcoming a few hurdles about ownership and. Yeah. And, and maintenance and all those things that we've got to deal with um, 
coastal management, which is yeah. in, in, in train at the moment. Um, there are a number of works out there. There's Shire, uh, South Coast Shire, uh, considering putting 20,000 for an equity at 20,000 towards yeah. a one-for-one one, um, fundraiser, which we can we can match. Yeah. So there's 40 to acquire something on that portion. There's a number of to the collection. Yeah, but again, where does the collection go? At the meeting last night, I uh, brought up a point that, for example, the club uh, could well enhance the areas in the hall. It doesn't necessarily mean that if it's an acquisition from this, all I'm saying is, it's a sale of an artwork for an artist from this event, exactly. which may well live in areas. Yeah, yeah. And if we have to put 20 in towards that acquisition for that township, fine, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. It'll, it'll add another dimension to the mural, which is part of the same thing, right. you know, being a plumber. Yeah. Mm, cool. uh, there are a number of other works in consideration we're putting to the Shire as well, to yeah. try and not lose that 20,000 yeah. contribution. Um, there's a long term, a whole lot of things in the back of my mind how this could really flourish. Is, um, uh, uh, Robert Hay, I said to him this morning at breakfast here, what do you think of uh, putting it over the pier? It's underwater. So that whole insulation is underwater. <laughs> And in time it becomes a fish habitat yeah. and it becomes a dive site like Cancun Sculpture Park. <laughs> That's a possibility. Queen's Park, right for a sculpture walk. So over a period of time, acquisitions from lawn mm. of the event go into positions along various walks around Queen's Park, which becomes then becomes an international attraction. Yeah. A, a, attraction uh, for, for when I travel, I often find myself finding out that there's any sculpture parks or yeah. you know, yeah. every museums around to visit. But that will give this town uh, a, a distinct edge on it. You didn't even mention the tower. Oh. Oh. How do I feel? How do I feel right now? I mean, it's just like slightly it's in the face. Slightly in the face. I think, you know. Okay, well, we're, we're replacing the throne with, with no, no, no. strategic. Trying to put that into place like no. treasury gardens. No, no. But what I'm saying is, oh, oh, you know, the Parliament House in Canberra. Or just love it. Actually, that's, that's, <laughs> what's interesting is, is public art has made a great giant shift in the last five years or ten years. But we have public art, we have something called destination public art. And destination public art is when you have a piece of public art, people actually travel to see that piece of art. Now there's another, a lot of art that you see as you pass by the street and you say, oh, that's nice, but okay, okay, okay. But destination public art is an essential. And one of the key things, there are many aspects of just public, uh, destination art. As a community, you would like to create a sculpture garden of destination public art because people then come to see that iconic piece of art. That's the ultimate goal. Um, and I think that's the trend when you start looking at acquiring pieces. You must examine, do they have longevity? Is the materials, if it's made of fiberglass, it will disintegrate. If, if, if you want to call it, so if you're spending a lot of money on something, it must have longevity. Or it must be priced in the context that you know that it's ephemeral, that it's going to disintegrate. And that's also beautiful. But be aware of what you're buying as a community. That it, that it have the ability to create a destination for your community for, and usually that is interactive in some ways, but not always, certainly not always. One of the best des pieces of destination art in, there are two in number which I like, there's a stone purse. Who did the stone purse? Probably could have said so. Oh, yes. it's not a girl. Yes. So bravo, both of you. Thank you for your brilliant work. Um, this morning on the radio, a woman was talking about the importance of cultural park. She said there's no way no her 14 year old son would go to the museum or go for a bookstore. But when she went to the cultural park, it involved both, and they were able then to sit down and have a lovely lunch and talk about culture and art. 
and the importance of expressing yourself through art or through your work. And I just wonder, nothing's going to happen without sponsorship, you know, sad. I just wonder if you get, you know, the cotton on type people to do a family walk and they sponsor it. Like, we all want a rich culture and it's going to come to a community through sponsorship and I just think it would be wonderful for this to grow and grow and grow and bring more geniuses to Australia, like Roman. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Sharon. I got tired of carrying my chair out there to fish. <laughs> I just put a dancer out there. Like, Why do we sing it? You know? Unfortunately, took out a family and told me these people are <laughs> cats. But, you know. So you remember forever when the fishermen get hooked on the throne. What was the second place that you got to? There's, outside the library, is an iconic piece. It's the corner of the library. Oh, that's that's, ex that's uh, extraordinary. Catch a strong. Because it has more than that. It makes you... Imagine this, the ruins of a library, the rise and fall of civilizations. It's more than just a thing to look at. It is, it, for me, and that, again, for my visual language, it represents the ephemeral aspect of civilization and how important the library is. So there's a direct tie between the library and the corner. I find that to be brilliant. But that's just mine. Language of life. Well, As a visual person, you actually think there's probably a whole building that you don't know. Yeah, I, isn't that interesting? Still. Isn't that just like, wow, what a brilliant. There, there is a time capsule in that piece. I know Petrus, he used to live here. Um, there's a, a time capsule in that, um, well, it's a sealed uh, bluestone box, basically. You stand there and look at it. It's sun. fallen over, but it's still all there. Yeah. It's just, it's well, fantastic. It's, and what I love about the first, is, no imagination. The purse is always shining, and the reason it's shining is because at the bottom, some of the little kids are sliding on that purse all day long. <laughs> it's like a continuous problem. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? It makes you smile, it gives you a sense, children play on it, and to, to talk about what Sally's talking about, it gives a way to introduce art in a playful manner. And I think playful is an essential word to reaching people who do not want the social constructs that we... You know the other one that really works on the corner of Swanson and Berg? The skinny, skinny... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So many people stop. Yeah. Isn't, that, isn't that just amazing? And Deborah Halpern's big piece, oh, by the water of the art, is just splendid. And so I have an emotional response to that. There are many pieces of art I look at and say, that's nice. But I don't have a strong emotional context. And if you're creating a sculptural garden, I would strongly suggest that be one of the criteria. That you have an emotional response. And interactive, and interactive. So I sometimes watch these little kids climb up their purse and slide down. Climb up the purse and slide down. And I'm thinking, oh, wonderful. And it's tied to the public purse, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the other thing that works is something that gets shiny from being touched. Yes. There's a little dog in the yeah. town hall. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The nose on the, in, the, in Florence, there's a, a board that you go into the market and everybody touches the nose and spend it for In Canberra, the old, in the old building in Canberra, there's a such a wonderful one, I mean, you've got brass shoes, and they're all bronze, and the front is silver, it's all gold, they're going to say, don't brass and silver. I don't know. Yes. So how wonderful is that, that three-dimensional art is communicating to people? I think that, and Stephen's opinion about the playfulness, I think that's a really technical part of it. And you see that you would think, how many hundred thousand hands have touched that? Yeah. Well, it's like, put its belly in, I think the greatest thing, and, and remove me from the fact that I made this moment, because that's not irrelevant. What's important to me is when I watch whole families get on it and sit. And the best thing I learned here was watching people take dog selfies. He looks up at the animals and he's like, oh, save me. Save me. I do take a point.
always said it's about the longevity of work. And again, that's a hard call. But when we look at quiet peace in the past, there have been so little that would qualify for a permanent work, like the dogs of them. Dean Pudding. Sorry? My grandma, I couldn't get my grandson off your chair. Thank you, grandma. I couldn't get my grandson off your chair. That's nice to know. Well, when I was there, there were two dogs. <laughs> and the, the crowd owner of the big dog was taking the, the photo, and the dogs were sitting there with their paws back. Going forward, who oh, oh, is one of my favorite people in town who runs Away, what's the story? Way to go. Way to go. She's an icon. She has a very distinctly beautiful smell. And she sent me a picture of her sleigh with all of her dogs. <laughs> and I thought, yes, this is, this is what we want to see. And what people don't realize when they're sitting on the throne, when they're putting their dogs on the throne, they're looking at the throne, they're appreciating the work and the bits and pieces of the rocks. So they're not just putting I'm sitting on the throne, that's where you can subconsciously learn a bit about that. I saw one person put their young daughter up there and they said, now show me the koala. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, but you know, it's, it's, um... Can I ask you about the koala? What? Can I ask you about the koala? Yes. It's got a very expressive look on its face for a koala. They're usually stupefied from the uh, stomach. Okay. I, I tell you, because I, I don't want to talk about so much because it's not about my art, but it's more in the context of public art. I, I was trained in Japan for nine years in sculpting. And um, sculpting in Japan, they say there has to be movement. There has to be movement. So I, when I realized I was going to make this here and not in China, but in China I handed the picture and said, thanks, I'll come back and leave. I'll clean it. So I'm working with these Australian sculptors who are really beautiful, beautiful people. But boy, this one looked at me and says, do you want eyelashes on it next? <laughs> because the koala, as we worked in it, because my, I have no skill at all. Absolutely no. I can't draw. I can't draw, I can't sculpt fingers. But I can tell a story. And in the story of the world, was the aquarius are growing on the throne. The animals are on the throne. It's the throne before we came. And then we, the lace work, of course, is because it's due to this area. But the, actually, the animals are growing on the throne. And it's important that the koala is kind of the old sentry who observes everything. And that gaze is very, very important. Now, you have the kookaburras who are singing, they are joyous. Because if you've ever, and you all see kookaburras, they are the most joyful birds in the world. And, you know, and they're the number one lizard catching bird in the world, by the way, in my research. Oh, I also research our koalas out of edible. Everybody might be searching. They said, if koala, koalas were edible, they would have been dead 10,000 years ago. <laughs> they can't extinct. The kangaroos are come sort of like sentinels. Just, they're looking here and there. And of course, the cockatoos are just the juvenile delinquents at the top. We're waiting for the french fries to fall off today. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's what's... And the, and the thylacine, the Tasmanian tigers, which did exist here, and I a lot of conflicting aspect of when they were gone. They went all the way to the Torres Strait. They talk about distemper, Hindu, all these different things competing with them. But the Thylacine, normally on the throne, we use the apex predator on the black lions, or we use some significant animal. And so that's why they are there. And, um, which is very unusual because normally I don't do things that are symbolic or conceptual, but here. But the platypus, they sculpted the platypus. And I went out and said, guys, it's wrong. And it's really, this really is really wrong. I said, no, no, no. Bill's too big, the eyes are wrong slant. The nose is wrong, there's no bumps on the thing here. And so we threw that one away. And we started with, there's a curl on the platypus's tail. It's up a little bit. 
which is unusual. And you start looking, and they have bumps on there. They don't have a smooth stuff. Old ones are kind of like morty, kind of like we get, you know, whatever. So I was at this at a party, and this woman said, quite, quite impressive woman, so I'm not or I love the platypus. I'm a great affectionado of platypi. <laughs> well, that's like maybe a red flag, you know what I mean? You know, I just can't, you can't, you can't train something like that. I said, yes, we sculpted it once, and being American, I realized it wasn't working, so I went up the bush, I shot one, I froze it, I froze it, I stuck it on the flag, we froze it, we cast it, and I used the eggs to make an omelet in the morning. It was a little dodgy, but the hot sauce covered it. And this poor woman looked at me like, oh! <laughs> and I said, don't, if we do it, don't even bother getting the eggs, just be done. <laughs> and uh, so each animal is very, very sculpted in a way that it has movement. Definitely, and that's, it's like there's a certain, and they all look at you in a strange kind of way. So, secret sort of Japanese techniques of sculpture. Thank you, everybody, and thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.